because he didn't just start here on earth, born to Mary. He was the, a king on a throne, seated at the right hand of God, in perfect union, perfect unity with the Father, surrounded by hundreds of millions of angels. And around him, the other 12 rulers are on their face, having cast their crowns at his feet. And he takes a look down at us at the problem of mankind. And it's not that he realizes because he knew, but there was a time at which he said, Dad, I got to go rescue mankind because they will never be able to make payment. And I, that's a wrong way to say it because they established this. God the Father established this before the foundation of the world. So it's like a wrinkle in time thing. I can't even wrap my head around it. But whatever the case is, there was a point in which Jesus stood up and took off his crown and laid his diadem in the corner and gave his ring back to his dad and took off his priestly and royal garb, dressed, undressed down to a loincloth and took a swan dive out of heaven to come here on a prisoner exchange for you and me. Hello, and welcome to the Shifting Culture podcast in which we have conversations about the culture we create and the impact we can make. We long to see the body of Christ look like Jesus. I'm your host, Joshua Johnson. Go to shiftingculturepodcast.com to interact and donate. And don't forget to hit the follow button on your favorite podcast app to be notified when new episodes come out each week. Go leave a rating and review. It's easy. It only takes a second and it helps us find new listeners to the show. Just go to the show page on the app that you're using and hit five stars and actually click that write a review button and write a review of Shifting Culture. Thank you so much. It really helps us out. You know what else would help us out? Share this podcast with your friends, your family, your network. Tell them how much you enjoy it and let them know that they should be listening as well. If you are new here, welcome. If you want to dig deeper, find us on social media at Shifting Culture Podcast, where I post video clips and quotes and interact with all of you. Previous guests on the show have included Brian Zond, Josh White, and Liam Burns. You can go back, listen to those episodes, and more. But today's guest is Charles Martin. Charles Martin is a New York Times and USA Today bestselling author of over 20 books. Charles and his wife, Christy, live in Jacksonville, Florida, where you might find him bow hunting, working out, or doing Taekwondo with his three boys. This was such a great conversation with Charles. While we explore the crucifixion of Jesus and its profound impact on Charles's life and faith, Charles shares a powerful personal experience encountering the sight of Jesus's scourging in Jerusalem, which gave him new insight into both God's wrath towards sin and his limitless love shown through Christ's sacrifice. We talk about struggling to comprehend the depth of Jesus's suffering and why he endured it, as well as the hope, the grace, and restoration available to all of us through faith in him. We also talk about the importance of community, narrative, and remembering Jesus's cross. So join arms with us as we go on pilgrimage towards the cross. Here's my conversation with Charles Martin. Charles, welcome to Shifting Culture. Really excited to have you on. Thank you so much for joining me. Hey, thanks for making room. I appreciate it. Yeah, of course. You know, as an introduction and to you and an introduction to really the cross of, and crucifixion of Jesus and where we're headed today, I want to know where has the the crucifixion, where has the cross of Jesus intersected in your own life? Let me let me back up just a just a couple of years. I was I've been to Israel six times. I love it. I love the people. I love the country. I love the topography, geography. I really love the food. Man, you get me near some shawarma and it is all over. And I just, I, I just love it. But on my third trip there, we managed to get a ticket down a, below the Western Wall to the Herodian Road, which sits about 30 feet below, you know, where people stand today. And without going into a lot of detail, we know it's Herodian because of the stamp, the border. We know it's the lowest thing. You can't excavate any lower than that because if you do, you hit the rock of Mount Moriah. And this particular road runs north to south along the western wall, and it runs basically from Pilate's Praetorium, or the soldier's garrison, all the way down to the southwest corner of the Temple Mount, and basically sort of ended or came pretty close to the steps that led out of the high priest's house, Caiaphas. 
And we had been, we'd been in the Galilee and following steps of Jesus. And we finally end up in Jerusalem. Like we always do. It's a pilgrimage. You know, we always, we're always, we, as soon as we land, we're following Jesus, but we're always doing it with an eye to the cross. I mean, that's, he's already set his face for that. So we're just following him and, you know, so everything leads to Jerusalem and we get there. We'd been through the garden. We'd been through the Mount of Olives. We had stood on the Southern steps. We'd been to Caiaphas house. And then that evening, we'd gotten a ticket to go down in this excavation that was a recent thing. They'd uncovered this road, and they had uncovered what they thought was the soldier's garrison, where Pilate interrogated Jesus. And we wind down. It's about 30 feet below, and you get down there. And the time, it wasn't lit very well. I mean, it, today, it's very nicely presented, and it's a beautiful tour, and everybody should go do it. But at the time, it was like, you know, a light bulbs hanging, hanging by wires that weren't all that, you know, Anyway, we get down there and uh, the stones are really big and smooth and they're wagon or, or wagon wheel tracks, grooves in the stone. And we get down to where they thought the garrison was and there's this hole in the stone. It's about 14 inches, maybe 12 inches in diameter. And what we learned from Roman record is that the soldiers would wedge a post into that hole. And they would lash the prisoner to the post and there they would scourge him. And we know that they did that there because right next to the hole is a a thing carved in the stone that's maybe two to three inches wide and it looks like a like a small gutter. And it's a blood groove and it was meant to catch what was spilling out of the man lashed to the post. And they, it goes over to a, a gutter that leads out. And then just about 12 feet away, if you're standing over that hole about 12 feet away, there's a series of 12, like 12, 10 or 12 vertical and horizontal lines. It looks like a big tic-tac-toe board, but it's more lines. And we know from history that that is uh, the residue of a game played by Roman soldiers called the King's Game. And there they would gamble for the belongings of the dude strapped to the post. We got down there at night and uh, I... I put all these pieces together and I remember staring down at that hole and I know I'm 54. I've known the Lord a long time. That does not mean I've always been obedient. I do not have the monopoly on that. I am a wretched black hearted sinner, but I do love the Lord. And it just struck me as I'm staring down over that thing. Like this really happened. I, I, I write stories for a living. I mean, you see these books, these are my novels behind me. I, I've, I've written 18 novels. So I, I have a, somewhat vivid imagination but for some reason the lord did a thing in me where it took it out of this story and i i just be and i just crushed me and i i remember sort of hitting the stone and i just wanted to put my palm on the stone i just wanted to touch it and i began having a conversation with the lord that sounded like what kind of king does this like really because I know me and I'm not worth the rescue and I'm not trying to play superficially humble. I'm just, the, the, the exchange is not equal. And uh, I just began asking the Lord through tears. I'm, I'm like, really, why? And he, I just, I, I'm not, I'm not telling you I heard him like you and I are hearing, hearing each other's voices right now, but it was more like an impression. And I felt like he just locked arms with me and he said, hey, walk with me back to my cross and I'll show you. And so that you, you, you ask about my intersection with the cross and that was a big one for me. And I began from there, I began sort of wrestling with, I wonder if I could, I wonder if I, ever, if I could ever tell that story in my own way and in my own style. And so the idea for this book sort of bubbled up and out of that moment. I was afraid to write it for about two years. And then I sat down to write it and it took me about nine months. And in those nine months, my intersection with him and his cross was about a daily sort of thing. And two things happened in that time with him. And I'm praying it happens with people who read my book. Not, I mean, not that I'm trying to control the outcome, but it was beautiful what he did. The first thing he did was I really saw that the only thing I bring to the cross, the only thing, I don't bring good works. I don't bring good intentions. There's nothing about me good. The only thing I bring is the sin that causes me to need it in the first place. And he allowed me to see that. Like he allowed Charles to see Charles really clearly. And it's not pretty. And if y'all knew my thoughts, you would agree with me. 
And uh, but he didn't leave me there. John tells us that we get that grace and truth are poured out on the lips of Jesus. And so if we're getting truth, we know it's wrapped in grace, and it's not cheap grace. It's the priceless kind because it cost him everything to provide it. And so he met me every day when I would walk back to his cross, literally, with the truth of me, which I asked him for, and then I hit my face in repentance, and I still do. And he met me with this sweet grace in the same way that he does with Peter on the beach after his resurrection. It's like, hey, just follow me. So, I don't know, that's a sort of a roundabout answer to your question, but that's that's all I got. I love it. I love it. But So, as, as you're going down, you know, 30 feet, below the wailing wall you're you're sitting there you're looking at this hole you're going by Caiaphas's house and you know as Caiaphas goes to to Pilate and you know Pilate saying you know should we kill your king and he's basically saying we have no king but Caesar and he's saying we're going to forgo the kingdom of God and we're going to say we we have the kingdom of the world and that's we know what power is and then Jesus himself goes to the cross and obliterates, you know, the kingdom of the world, brings about this this kingdom of God through the scourge and the the ugly, gruesome crucifixion. I mean, it's a it's a torture place. I mean, it's as yeah. you you were broken. I mean, he's he's tortured and on a cross for us. How do we reconcile a God? that comes here and puts himself through all of that for us when we're living in this world where it's all, you know, what Caiaphas was all about was power and uh, earthly power, but it's something different. How do we start to approach this cross and this God and this Jesus that we have that would actually put himself through this? One of the things I felt like he did with me in this book, and a publisher labeled it sort of like a devotional. I think that's how it's classed. You know, if you look it up on any of the sales, whatever, it's, it's, you find a, I don't know, I'm not a devotional guy and I'm not knocking them. Please don't hear that. I just, it's never been my thing. I, I grew up on Oswald Chambers, but that's about all I know about it, about a devotional. But as I got into it, what it felt like for me was a pilgrimage. There's this psalm, I'm going to mess it up, but I think it's 84, and it says, Blessed is the man whose strength is in you, whose heart is set on pilgrimage. And I found that as I sort of got into this, and I was trying to understand, I was just asking simple questions, like, really, Lord, why? And I felt like he took me back to well, he did. He took me back to the garden and we, we, we sort of spent some time studying the story of the garden because in God's economy, in his kingdom, he doesn't just brush off sin. It, he hates it and he's just. And so for whatever reason, and I can't pretend to tell you that reason. I don't know. When we get to heaven, he'll explain it to us. The, the best analogy I can come up with is if you and I had you know, a five-year-old girl or a young child and and or boy and he or she was abducted and that person took them someplace horrible and did inexplicable horrible things and then several weeks later they were caught and brought into you know jail prison whatever and eventually the day for the the trial came how would you feel if that person who had committed such evil walked in and said to the judge judge I was just having a bad day man it it, it just it was just you know there was one thing led to another, and, he, and and then the judge, after hearing this story, says, "Look, man, I have had those kind of days too. So look, let's just let's just call it let's just call it square and don't do it again." Well, you and I would come unglued, and the reason we would come unglued is because there is a thing in us that knows and wants justice for evil, and that thing in us doesn't start with us; it starts with him. So. When Adam and Eve fell and sinned, God covered their sin with the skin of an animal. So that we know from the moment sin occurred, there was a covering of animal skin for that sin. It cost the animal everything to shed its blood, 
to rid itself of its skin and cover them. So throughout the history of the nation of Israel, we see the payment for sin against the wrath of God, which is stored up. The difference, though, prior to Jesus is that all of the payment for sin, the lambs sacrificed on the altar, especially the Day of Atonement, only covers that sin for one year. It's a covering. And then we see Jesus who walks up at about age 30 and John, his cousin, says, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is a totally different thing. And so the the difference in Jesus, the shed blood of Jesus versus the, a, a sacrificial lamb, is that we don't have to go back to the cross every year and Jesus be re-crucified every year. There was one payment for sin which satisfied forever the wrath of God. Jesus made propitiation on our behalf, which just blew me away when I pressed into it. And I, you and I, you talk about the scourging. Well, r- the Romans, the Romans perfected both the scourging and crucifixion because the scourge is like a, you know, a piece of wood that's about four feet long, and then it's got like four or five foot tassels. And on the end of it are these pieces of rock and stone and iron. And so when it is slung at, this is not an Indiana Jones whip. This is a thing that when it's slung, it wraps around the person and it embeds in the flesh. And when it is pulled off, it removes that flesh. This is why Isaiah says he became unrecognizable as a man. So by the time Jesus is force marched out the Damascus gate carrying his crossbar, He's been shredded. He's hamburger. He doesn't, he doesn't even look like Jesus anymore. That's why they tap Simon and tell, ask him or tell him, command him, carry this for him because he's not going to make it. Then they post him up on this tree. The two greatest needs in, in life, uh, so I am told, are air and water. After that, there, there are needs after that, but without those, life is really short. And on the cross, Jesus can't get either because he drowns in his own lung fluid. And because he'd been beat and his all of that flesh removed, I don't know if you've ever really been really thirsty. I, I mean, we've all been thirsty to some extent, but I don't know. Just the picture of Jesus shredded, hamburger, unrecognizable, making payment that we could not pay, showed me that, G, that God the Father is really serious about his wrath, and he's not just brushing it under the rug, which also shows you the limitless love of Jesus, which we you clue into a little bit in John 17 when he says, so that the love with which you have loved me might be in them and I in them. It's a beautiful conversation. That's heartbreaking and that is uh, disturbing. And it's it's beautiful at the same time. It's it's a paradox. You know, you're, no, you're looking at the this ugly cross, but you're looking at like the most beautiful thing that's happened in right. human history. And you got to ask, and one of the things I began asking is he didn't just start here on earth, born to Mary. He was a king on a throne, seated at the right hand of God in perfect union, perfect unity with the Father, surrounded by hundreds of millions of angels. And around him, the other 12 rulers are on their face, having cast their crowns at his feet. And he takes a look down at us at the problem of mankind. And it's not that he realizes because he knew, but There was a time at which he said, Dad, I got to go rescue mankind because they will never be able to make payment. And that's a wrong way to say it because they established this. God the Father established this before the foundation of the world. So it's like a wrinkle in time thing. I can't even wrap my head around it. But whatever the case is, there was a point in which Jesus stood up and took off his crown and laid his diadem in the corner and gave his ring back to his dad, and took off his priestly and royal garb, dressed undressed down to a loincloth, and took a swan dive out of heaven to come here on a prisoner exchange for you and me. That started getting to me when I began trying to unwrap that. Wow. Wow. And so as you're you're walking through these 40 days, as you're writing, it is finished. What was one one of the days that you take us through that was really impactful for you? that you you sat with and you were kind of in awe of of Jesus while you were riding that day. The word to tell us die, we translate as it is finished. And that is true. It's correct translation. I am told, I'm not a great Hebrew and Greek scholar, but I am told that a more accurate translation is 
it is perfectly perfect or it is completely complete. So I began looking back into the story of when 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 was per, when, when were we when was mankind in perfect unity and complete unity? Well, obviously in the garden. And then you know, granted, I, I I'm outside of scripture here, so you got to understand that I'm and I admit that in the book. But there was a point at which the angel marched Adam and Eve, who were real people with real funny bones and real tears and real emotions, walked them out of the garden. The lock shut, and I think they had two emotions. One was, oh my, what have we just done? And two, how do we get back there? Because at this point, everything changes. The world is going to hell in a handbasket. They they have gone from perfection to imperfection, from blessing to curse, from life to death, from food that never rots to maggots, from no death to one son killing another and burying him. And then think about it. Either Adam or Eve buried the other. So they think they went from everything perfect to this fallen place. And it has, and it is the desire of the father to return us to that place. That's why he tells the nation of Israel in Exodus, I have brought you to myself. And then Jesus comes on this rescue mission, and what he's trying to return us to is perfect unity. I mean, that's why he says, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. The Father's the destination. But we can't get there without having satisfied the wrath of God. So Jesus in his mercy makes payment we can't pay and offers us access both to the Father and his love for us. And somewhere early in the first I don't know, seven days or something of this book, I sort of, I just sort of had this realization that the Lord, God Most High, has spent all of human history trying to bring us back to himself. And that's a crazy, furious kind of love that I don't think we understand. How does that change the way that we live in the world when we start to get a glimpse of that furious, crazy love that he has for us. Well, sometimes when I'm talking to people like you and you ask me questions, how should we, they feel a little bit above my pay grade because you're asking me to translate what he's done in me to all of us. So let me, let me, let me just tell you about me and the, whoever's listening can translate it to themselves. And so I, I, I walk here with fear and trembling, but what he What he did with me as I came to have a truer revelation of who he is through his word and by the power of his spirit, I came to see the extent to which he has gone, continues to go, and will continue to go to snatch me back out of the kingdom of darkness. And when I saw the inequality of what he gets in the exchange, me for him, it just, I, I can't tell you the number of days I sat in my chair, which is right over here, right on a, on a lap desk. And I would find myself weeping because he, he just, it's a, it's a, no matter, no matter how far I have strayed in my life, there is no place on planet earth that the blood of Jesus can't snatch me back. And I put this in the book. I said, there is, I said, if you hear anything I write in this whole thing, however many pages and words that is, if you remember anything from this book, remember this. There is more grace in Jesus than sin in us, period. And the, you have an enemy that wants you to not believe that. And there, I've, I've talked with guys in prison and even folks in you know lifers and death row, and they can't, they can't understand that God would love them I got a crazy letter a couple of months ago from a a lady on death row. We all know her story. It was in the news. It's horrible. It's, it's a, it's, it's horrible. It's, it's the, one of the worst things I've ever heard. And she landed there. And when we were dead in our trespasses and sins, he made us alive. Well, he did something in her when she landed behind those bars and he made her alive and he brought a dead woman to life. And she loves Jesus. 
and she's like crazy repentant. And she wrote me a letter and she knows she deserves to be there. And she's, you know, she's not trying to make excuses, but she said, look, here's the thing. If Jesus Christ is not the solution to the problem of mankind, there is no solution. She's right. There is absolutely more grace and mercy in him than sin in us. And we have an enemy that is working really hard to make sure we do not believe that. So as we're, we're walking in this pilgrimage towards the cross and we're starting to realize that there's more grace in Jesus, that there is sin in us, how do we as people or how have you in community had the embodied presence of Jesus in others to remind us, hey, let's start to, to shift our focus back to Jesus because the enemy is here to distract us. The enemy is here to steal, kill, and destroy and so we, I think we need each other to remind us, hey, Jesus is here. There's more grace there for us. Let's, let's return back to him. How, how can we, and what are some steps for us to, to remind ourselves in community? One of the things I love about the letters of Paul is he kind of cuts to the chase pretty quick. And if you read the letters of Paul, he, he always starts off with the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you. And then he thanks God for whoever he's writing to, except one letter. In the letter to the Galatians, he skips the thanking God at all. He basically spends two chapters reaming him a new orifice. And by the time you get to chapter three, he says, Foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you before whose eyes Jesus Christ was personally portrayed as crucified? And what we learn about the church in Galatia is that these are these were eyewitnesses to the arrest crucifixion, death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. They saw it with their own eyes. They heard the man speak. And Paul is basically saying, hey, yo, guys, have you have you forgotten? You saw this man die. You heard what he said. You saw him return. How have you, what, what has caused you to take your eyes just a little bit off? Because a little bit here is a whole lot down there. And he, we learned that they have, They've taken their eyes off the cross. And one of the things that I love about Paul is Paul, Paul never did. He said, I desire to know nothing amongst you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. Which, think about that for a minute. Like, of all the things Jesus did, I mean, he fed 5,000, he healed the paralytic, the lime, excuse me, the lime, the blind, the lame, the, 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 the uh, Lazarus. I mean, how about Jesus Christ and him, you know, him raising the But no, because without the cross, none of that matters. And he could have said Jesus Christ and the and the in the empty tomb, which is the singular basis for our statement of faith. But but before you get to the tomb, it walks underneath the shadow of this cross. Without the cross, there is no empty tomb. There is no payment. There's no satisfying the wrath of God. I love that by the time he gets to the end of Galatians, somewhere in the, in the middle part of chapter six, he says, "God forbid that I should boast, except in the cross of our Lord and Savior." So. You ask about what can we do in community, and I don't know. I got a I got a band of brothers I do life with. It's eleven guys. We've done life together for about fifteen years, and the Lord has done beautiful things through us. He's healed us. He's delivered us. He's met us in our grief. He's joined us in our joy. He has used each of us to point out in each of us where we're missing something. And you know, there's, scripture that Paul, there's a scripture that says, I think it's Paul says, it's the kindness of God that leads us to repentance. And he's used us because of our friendship and our brotherhood and our love for one another that, that we have hearts to be able to hear each other most of the time. I'm, I'm not always meek and teachable, but I'm working on it. But he's used us because we trust each other and we love each other. We're able to say hard things or at least ask questions that allow us to see maybe what we don't. And one of the things I love about doing life with them is on most nights when we get together, our prayers inevitably start with real, real gut-wrenching repentance. Just wanting to be authentic with the Lord and not show up with a lie between us and him. And so 
I don't know how people make it in this life or in this walk of faith without brothers. Or I don't know. I don't know how you do that. I don't know how you don't. I mean, the paralytic did not get to Jesus without four friends. So I don't know how, you know, my pastor Joby talks about the four Matt toters. I don't know how you get through life without four Matt toters. And I'm grateful that the Lord has given me some brothers who don't judge me, but that walk alongside me and, uh, and help love me and each other, you know, through what can be difficult stuff. Yeah. I'm so glad you have that because I think uh, some people don't and they need it. And so I think, you know, my encouragement to anybody who's listening is to go seek that out and not just wait for somebody to approach you, but seek others out so that you can start to walk with them towards Jesus, towards the cross of Jesus. And, you know, one of the things that you do really well uh, is that you write stories. You are a narrative person. And I think one thing that really helped me see Jesus in a new light was to look at the narrative of scripture and to look at the whole story arc and not just, you know, knowing the, the doctrine of things, but actually seeing the whole story play out. How, what's the importance of narrative and story as we approach and go on pilgrimage towards the cross of Jesus? Well, let's first start with the danger of narrative and story because there's an admonition in the somewhere about the all oh, the middle of Revelation. I'll forget the chapter, but there's an admonition to guys like me who come along and try and write and tell this story. If anything, if we add anything to it, it's not it does not end well for us. So I've always started out my my desire to t- try and tell the story of Jesus with Lord. Please don't let me get outside of of you help me figure out how to use the scripture you've given us to to interpret the scripture you've given us and i also think i'm pretty clear in in the places where i'm trying to tell the story that i say look scripture says this but let me let me try and help you see it from this perspective and one example would be this when jesus says i thirst to satisfy all scripture which is psalm 69 it says that there was a, a, a jar of sour wine nearby and the soldiers put a sponge on a stick and held it to his mouth. Well, you can read that and you can think that that's somewhat of a merciful act. And I've heard that taught as a merciful thing. They had mercy on Jesus. Well, if you look at their behavior in the moments and hours prior, there's nothing merciful about the soldiers treating of Jesus. You also have to understand that the Roman army at the time of the life of Jesus, is the largest army in the history of the world. A large army has to be fed. A fed army has to go to the bathroom. And that can cause sanitary problems if they're not careful. So that when Roman soldiers were conscripted or taken in or assigned, given they were given sandals, they were given a certain type of armor, they were certainly given a sword and a spear. They were also given three other things. They were given a jar of vinegar, they were given a stick, and they were given a sponge. And then they were instructed with how to clean their backsides because in the first century, vinegar is a commonly used antiseptic and astringent for most everything. So the reason the Roman army was so successful, one of the reasons, and so successful in long campaigns is because they knew how to maintain a sanitary army. Well, that sponge on a stick has a name. It's called a tersorium, and we see this throughout Roman record and history. So the fact that it's sitting there not too far from the cross is not a wonder. It's like first century toilet paper. When Jesus says, I thirst, in my opinion, some mocking soldier laughing dips his tersorium in feces-laced vinegar and shoves it down the throat of Jesus. Here, drink this. That's a very different look on the last few moments of Jesus' life. Now, do I know 100% certain that that is what happened? No, but I'm pretty sure I tend to think so. I also think I'm pretty safe in that, in, in, in adding that historical record to how we look at that. Does it, in the grand scheme of things, does it matter? No, but it does give us a view of Jesus that they're still mocking him. And, and even, even past that, I mean, think about it. Think of the shame 
He's he's also naked. All these pictures that we have or paintings that we have of Jesus and our loin, it's not true. He's totally naked. We know that from scripture. It says that the, the woman stood at a distance. The only woman to come close was his mother. Why did they do that? Because he's naked. They're trying to shame him. And so there is Jesus, the Son of God. He's the brightness of the Father's glory. He upholds all things by the word of his power. He fashioned you and me from the dust. He's, he strung 10 trillion stars into the night sky and calls them by name. He told the ocean where to stop. He told the mountains high and high. And yet he willingly allows his very own creation to whip him mercilessly, undress him, nail him to a tree, and then shove feces down his throat while he's drowning in his own lung fluid, carrying literally every sin for all mankind for all time on the weight of his shoulders. And the thing that I can't understand, and I probably won't until I get to heaven, is that he didn't call down heaven. He could have called down all those angels. He could have thrown lightning bolts with accuracy. And he didn't. And that's a crazy kind of mercy that I just don't understand. I want to. And I know that he he extended that then and he continues to extend it now. I I left the writing of this book with, Lord, I know that I don't love you the way that I know that I don't love you in my heart the way that I really I want to in my head, and I want to. So would you please do the thing in me that lets me walk in greater obedience, greater faith, and lets me just fu- do that. I I want to I want to walk with you and hear you. Will you help me do that? I don't know how we got there, but that's somehow you asked me something and I tried to answer. <laughs> Well, this is what I want want to say. I think facing the grotesque nature of the cross is important. I think a lot of people try to sanitize the cross to totally. make it l- more palatable for us to talk about, you know, every every Sunday. So, how, what does it do to us? How do, why is facing the grotesque nature of the cross so important? Well, if we can whitewash it, it doesn't hurt as much. I mean, if we can, you know, if you can just sort of hang him up there and let him bleed out, you know, it's just a, I don't know, maybe it's a a mundane Friday execution. I don't know. Here's part of the picture, though, that I, I just, this one got to me. Jesus is in the middle. There are two thieves on either side, murderers, whatever they are. One is railing at him, cussing him out. If you are who you say you are, save us. The guy on the other side shakes his head and says, dude, we are getting our just reward. We we deserve this. Can't you see that this man does not? And it just blew me away that that thief on the cross is a couple feet from Jesus. And he has a bird's eye view of literally the redemption of mankind. He has a perspective that no one in history ever had. And something happens in him. Something something happened where the day before, whatever crime he committed, that was his life's plan. And it ended him on this cross right next to Jesus, which has been the plan throughout the ages for him to be there. And, and then something happened in his heart and you hear it in his language. He says, Lord, when you come into your kingdom, will you remember me? And there's a submission of his heart to the Lordship of Jesus. And we know We know something about that joker that cannot be said of anybody else in scripture. And that is this. He, right this second, is in heaven with Jesus. Now, as I unpacked this, what did he do to earn that? Or what did he do to get that? Well, he didn't join a discipleship group. Didn't walk down front of the church. Has no church membership. He can't tell you squat about the Christology or any of Jesus or the doctrine of scripture he he, he wouldn't even know how to spell it the, 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 he didn't he can't this guy can't even raise his hands in worship because they're lashed to a crossbar the only thing he does is he believes that jesus is who he says he is and that he is returning to his kingdom and the only way that thief has access to that kingdom 
is submitting wholeheartedly to his lordship and his righteous reign. And he does that. And it's a, be- it's the, it's the most beautiful picture because that it, it gives us hope. Like all of us think, but we have this like Pharisee thing in us. All of us think that we got to do something, some sort of work plus belief to really, it, like if you really boil us down, we, we, you know, the scripture says, for everyone who believes. Well, belief is the key that gets us access. Well, we think, well, I got to do this or I got to do that. And I look, once we fall in love with him, there should be an obedience of our heart that comes out of us. And our works are obedience driven. They are not, you know, this is James. It's show me your faith without works. I'll show you my with it. It's, so it's, we fall in love with him and there's a thing in us that we want to be more like him. So we begin, our lives begin looking, but those things don't get us access to him. So it was a beautiful thing where I saw this thief that it just it takes the pressure off. I'm not I'm not I'm not I'm not selling cheap grace. I am I am I am sh- I am showing the beautiful mercy of Jesus on the cross, bringing one more into his kingdom and the only thing that guy did was believe that Jesus is who he says he is. And uh I I just love it. It it, it did a thing in me that it Really, it kind of like broke some legalistic chains that I didn't know I was carrying. I would have told you that I wasn't, but it it, it did. It kind of broke some chains, and I'm not u- I'm not using that as a license to not do something or a license to sin. I'm not saying that at all. It just it was just a beautiful thing where that joker places his faith. Just the 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 Hebrew word is pastuo to believe in Jesus. There's a massive difference between believing in and believing that. Because the demons believe that Jesus is the Son of God, but they ain't going into the kingdom of heaven. Yeah, even as somebody like you know Peter, who believed in Jesus, uh, denied him right at the cross. But you mentioned, uh, you know, at the very beginning, you mentioned a little bit about the story of when he was restored back to Jesus on the beach after they, they went fishing. Can you take us into that? What happens? How do how does the cross of Jesus there, and how does Jesus Himself then restore Peter back to Him, even when there was a denial at the cross? Well, let me just say this, and, and, and this is this may not be popular with your listeners, but here's the truth of this whole story with Peter. The truth is, we are all Peter. We have all denied Him ten thousand times. Peter only did it three times. We've all denied Him a bunch. So let's don't. Let's not try and put Peter over here that he's somehow different, that he denied Jesus at his, look, we're all Peter. Now, here's the thing about that story. That one of the things I, I, that, that I think about it is on his, in his, on his third denial, Peter is standing around a charcoal fire and the slave girl says, are you one of his followers? And Peter says, no, but you got to notice the charcoal fire because it's only mentioned twice in scripture. Jesus is resurrected. He's crucified, resurrected. He says, uh, he basically says, hey, tell Peter I'm, I'm going to come find him. And Peter doesn't feel worthy. He's wrapped in shame. He does not know. At one point, he was captain of the team, and then he denies Jesus, and he doesn't feel worthy to do anything having to do with Jesus. So he says, look, see you boys later. Peace out. I'm going back to my old way of life. I'm going fishing. And they don't really know what to do either. And so they just follow him. And you find these guys in a couple of boats on the Sea of Galilee. And Peter is stripped down to, you know, his shorts or whatever fishing and they see jesus on the beach and someone and somebody says it is the lord and then notice what peter does says he puts on his cloak now who when they're about to go swimming gets dressed he's he's in shame so he's trying to cover up he gets to the beach and you see this beautiful conversation It's what is one of my favorite in all of scripture because it's the it is the most beautiful do-over in the history of do-overs and how does jesus start it with a charcoal fire on the beach. Peter lands on the beach. He smells that charcoal and he's like, oh no, really? We got to go back here. And Jesus takes him back to the very place of denial. And, and I've heard this taught where the, 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 somebody has taught it saying that it was a, you know, sort of a poking Peter in the chest thing. Like, come on, man. Like, why did you deny me? Feed my sheep. And do you love me? And I don't think that's the way it went down. I think Jesus made the fire. I think he cooked the fish. I think Peter sits down. He's probably got his hair over his eyes. He, he doesn't want to look at Jesus. He's ashamed. And I think, I think Jesus sat down next to him, handed him the plate and put his arm around him. And I think he probably leaned in and said, hey, buddy, you love me? 
Well, yes, Lord, you know I love you. All right, then feed my sheep. Peter eats a little bit and he says, hey, buddy, you you love me? Well, Lord, you, you know that I love you. All right, then feed my lambs. Well, last time, he's probably finishing up. He probably, he probably can't even swallow it because he's got so much indigestion at this point. And Jesus says, you love me? And Peter can't even respond to love. He said, well, yes, Lord, you know that I phileo or I, I like you. He, 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 he's, he's trying to just come down like, you know, at least I did this right. And Jesus, I think he just pushes his forehead up against his buddy and he says, hey, feed my sheep. And then he says the two words that Peter's heart is crying out to hear. Because he doesn't feel worthy to do the thing Jesus is about to tell him to do. And Jesus looks at him and he says, Peter, follow me. It's the most beautiful do-over ever. It's the most beautiful, mercy-filled conversation ever. And I think at that moment, Peter probably stood up on the beach and, and just like fist pumped or hugged Jesus or something because he, he's now been brought back in and he has been welcomed back and given orders to do the thing that he wants to do, but he just hasn't felt worthy because the enemies will, you know, eat his lunch with shame. And so I, I love that. I love that picture. I love that conversation. It's, it's been a big marker for me. And it's been a big marker for people that I've, I don't have some great big prison ministry, but I've been in, you know, a good number. And if you tell that story in prison, you'll see jacked men with a bunch of tattoos weeping their faces off because the enemy tells them they're not worthy. And the truth is that they are. So beautiful. It's my favorite story in scripture. It just, it, I just love that Jesus at the end just wants to have a barbecue on the beach with his friends and that he restores Peter. And it's just, it's just such a beautiful story. Uh, and it gives me a greater excuse to have barbecue. So, amen. Oh. <laughs> so it's good. You know, what would you, what, what hope do you have for your readers to get out of it is finished? What would you hope that they get? Yeah. yeah. Look, the Lord took me on a pilgrimage with himself and he revealed himself to me in ways that I had not known. And it was a beautiful revelation, and he did it through his word and by the power of his spirit. And my prayer for folks reading this is not that he reveals to them the same things he revealed to me. I, I'm not trying to control the outcome. I don't even know how to do that. All I know how to do is lock arms with people and say, hey, let's walk back to the cross, and you can see me or watch me hit my face and cry out, and then I'm just going to like pass you off to the Lord and let him do with you whatever he wants and needs to do in you so that you might maybe remember or even know for the first time who he is. And when I was wrestling with whether or not to write this, and I was, prob- I was probably, af- probably afraid, thinking, I don't know if I could pull it off. I felt like the Lord said, Charles, look, just lock arms with him and bring him to me, and I'll take it from here. <laughs> it was kind of, it was almost kind of funny. It was like, wow, Lord, that's a good idea. And so I just, that's kind of been my posture, just to walk with me back to the cross. So as I've met with folks and they signed this book for folks, and as I pray for folks that are reading this and diving in, my prayer is that the Lord will just meet it. If we had a fresh, right revelation, scripture-inspired revelation of Jesus, man, what would it do? Like, what would it do in us and to us and through us and for us and I am so hungry for that, and I, I've met people who are, and so I pray that I pray that that happens. Amen, amen. A couple uh, uh, quick questions. Uh, one, Charles, if you could go back to your 21 year old self, what advice would you give? Fear is a liar, and he's a defeated liar. He has a microphone, and you can choose whether or not to listen to it. We walk by faith and not by sight. And without faith, it's impossible to please him. So punch that joker in the teeth and do what requires faith because fear ain't never done squat. It, it, nothing. Read Hebrews 11. Fear did nothing. Faith stopped the mouths of lions and returned the dead back to life. So I would encourage 21-year-old me, man, don't give fear. Don't let it live rent-free in your head ever. 
And it is a spirit, and it does need to be called out and named and cast out and rebuked, all of that by the Spirit of God. And that's it. And we, I mean, that's why it says, do not be afraid more than anything else in Scripture. 65 times. Yeah. And then one for every day. One for every day. So, perfect. I love that. I love that. Anything you've been reading or watching lately you could recommend? No, I'm look, I'm 75% of the way through a novel, um, which I had to put on pause for this book tour. So um, I'm going to, we just got back in an hour, a couple hours ago from, so I'm going to, I'm going to rest up today, get back to that. I hadn't been watching or reading anything except what I've been working on. And yeah, sorry, I, I got nothing for you. I would love to sound educated there, but no. We're, we're talking about your book. It is finished. How about, how about? a book that you have written you've written 18 novels you said yeah what's one novel that stands out for you that you would you would recommend to people listening i wrote a trilogy called the keeper series it starts with the water keeper then the letter keeper then the record keeper so uh, i would i would go to the water keeper and start there because it it's it's the story of a man who constantly and at great expense to himself leaves the safety of his community leaves the safety of the 99 to find the one who is lost it's a rescue story it's not majorly christian easy it's not going to thump you over the head with an agenda it's fun storytelling but it might shake some things loose it's also pretty darn fast fast paced if i may if I so say if i may say so myself uh, so hold on. Awesome. Awesome. That's good. How could people connect with you? Uh, go out and get this book. Uh, I have a website, charlesmartinbooks.com. You can find me all over social media. Yeah, those two. <laughs> Perfect. Well, go out and uh, get It Is Finished. Charles, this is a, a fantastic book. I thank you for going on pilgrimage, locking arms with me as your reader, um, and bringing me to the the cross, and uh, it's so amazing to be able to sit there at the cross and actually what you did today in this conversation to to encounter the grotesque aspect of of what Jesus did and endured on the cross for us, that the love of God would really go anywhere to find us, that he would go into the depths of Sheol to find us. We can't escape that love and we can't. And the grace of Jesus is so much greater than any of the sin that we have. And so thank you for this conversation. Thank you for your book. I love walking through it. And so as we're in this season right now, the season of, of Lent and leading up to, to Easter leading to to Good Friday when we're actually encountered this cross. I just pray that people would start to dive into it so that they could start to go on pilgr- pilgrimage and journey towards the cross and see what Jesus will do for you in that. So, Charles, thank you for this conversation. Thank you for this book. It was fantastic. Thanks so much for having me. I appreciate you. Thank you for listening to the show today. If you're really enjoying the show, please don't forget to hit the follow button on your favorite podcast app. You could do it right now. Just hit that little plus. Um, And then I would love it if you would leave a rating and review on Apple Podcasts. So you could go right now to the show and leave a star rating uh, and review and let us know how you are enjoying the show. And find us on Facebook and Instagram. So if you want to connect, interact, Uh, I post a lot of quotes and different things that you could actually interact with the episodes and let me know how you are enjoying the show. If you feel inclined to donate, uh, there is a support the show link in the show notes, um, and it would send you directly to a page where you could donate so that new episodes can be produced for your enjoyment. So thank you so much for listening, uh, and I hope you have an incredible week.